Can you or someone you know benefit from additional food items? Come visit us Saturday at the Bountiful Harvest Food Pantry from 1 to 3 p.m. We are also seeking additional volunteers to assist with setup and food distribution. Please give us a call or text us at 678-468-0868 for more information. Again, that number is 678-468-0868. Spread the good news. We look forward to seeing you there. Do you or someone you know need prayer? We at Harvest Rain Church International invite you to connect with us for a social distancing drive through prayer experience at the Academy at Harvest Rain, located at 51 Sonoy Road in Fairburn, on Saturday, August 22nd, from 1 to 3 o'clock p.m. For more information, you can contact us at 770-969-2040. That's 770-969-2040. We look forward to seeing you and praying for you at our drive through Prayer on the Move. Daughters of the King Women's Ministry is hosting a virtual Paint and Praise event August 29th and 30th from 3 to 6 p.m. We would love for you to join us. Space is limited and on a first come, first serve basis. This is a fun, uplifting event that is ensured to inspire creativity. Create your own masterpiece while praising God and connecting with others, all from the comfort and safety of your home. Each painter will be supplied with the essentials and step-by-step -step instructions by our personal art innovator, Color Frenzy. Curbside pickup is also available. Please visit harvestrain.org for this and all upcoming events for more information. We look forward to seeing you at the virtual Paint and Praise event. Join us Sunday mornings in the parking lot of Harvest Rain Church from 8.30 to 9.30 a.m. Bring your entire family and your pets too. And let's worship together in the parking lot of Harvest Rain Church and hear praise and worship plus an inspirational message from Pastor Doug. And sometimes you got to talk to yourself and say, you know what? I don't care how you feel. We're going to rejoice in the God of our salvation. Sometimes you have to command yourself to open your mouth and bless your God. Sometimes you got to talk to yourself and speak over yourself and prophesy over yourself and say, self, I don't care how you feel. We're going to bless God. I don't care how you feel. We're going to worship God. We're going to give him some praise. We're going to honor him. We're going to keep our focus on him. Do not allow any thought that is not a godly thought to resonate in your mind. See you Sunday. God bless you this morning. Thank you so much for tuning in. Let's uh, bow our heads for a word of prayer. Uh, Father, we just bless you and we honor you this morning. Father, we thank you once again for allowing us, Father, to gather around the word of the Lord. And Father, we welcome the ministering gift of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we welcome your presence. We invite you in. We ask that you would come and minister to our hearts this morning. And Father, we pray that as we study the word of the Lord, God, we pray that something will be spoken, Lord, that will minister life and hope into the hearts of the people of God. And Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you this morning. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, this month, if you um, have not been with us, we're doing a teaching on God's divine provision. And uh, this morning, I want to talk to you about blessed by divine permission. My title is being blessed by divine permission. Um, biblical economics is totally different from uh, the world system. Um, when it comes to biblical economics, uh, it's not based on money. Biblical economics is based on having access to God. Uh, it's where you are claiming no ownership 
of anything, but you have uh, access to, to everything. And so it's where you understand when it comes to biblical economics is where you have a revelation or you have an understanding that everything you have uh, originated from God and it belongs to God. And God allows you to use what you have. And so you understand that you've been blessed by divine permission and that the blessings that you are receiving and enjoying in your life are as a result of God and that they're alone to you until you pass on to glory. Um, now, biblical economics is something that you have to um, get a revelation of. Uh, biblical economics is not something whereby I can lay my hands on you and impart into you uh, the understanding of uh, biblical economics. It's something that you have, to, you have to catch. You have to get a revelation of it. It's not something where you can just read the word and, you know, okay, I got it. No, it's something that you have to, you have to read the word, then you have to act out on what you, you read or what you read, and then you have to uh, see God or experience God, should I say, uh, um, um, carry out his word in your life. But I, I, I promise you, once you get a understanding of biblical economics, once you get a hold or get a revelation of biblical economics, uh, it would totally change your life. Um, in 1997, uh, that's when I actually caught a hold of the revelation of God's divine provision. Up until that point, uh, I was reading the word, I was tithing, I was giving, but I was doing it because I had a heart for God and the word told me to do it. But I did not make a connection, nor had I experienced God's divine hand in my finances up to that point, to my knowledge. Um, but it was 1997 when I went to a conference and a man of God placed a challenge on everyone. And I just decided to, you know, go along with the challenge. Actually, I wasn't really, I don't know. I, I, I just went along with it. He was a man of God. It was Shambach. A lot of you may uh, remember Shambach. And uh, Shambach, he placed this, 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 this demand on everyone to, to give a certain amount. And he said within... 90 days, God was going to do X and X. And of course, I'm there. Um, I'm young in the Lord. And I just decided to go along with it, not really knowing whether or not it was going to happen or not. Because up, to that, up until that point, my understanding of tithing and divine provision was based on academics. It was based on the logic that I had from reading the word. I read the word. The word said do it. So I did it. But there was no divine revelation in my spirit about it. I was just acting on obedience to the word and of acting from my intellectual capacity, if you will. But I obeyed and it was less than 90 days that God came through for my wife and I and for the ministry. And once I saw that, once I experienced that in my life, I'm like, okay, this is, there's something to this. And then I went on and did something else in terms of planting the seed and just to see, okay, let me try this again. And once I got involved and caught up into seesawing and, and, and watching and documenting God coming back and blessing uh, my faith, I got it. It was like, man, this is, this is real. This, this happens for real. This is some real stuff here. And I caught the revelation. And from that point on, um, I, you know, I've been operating that way ever since, since 1997. I, I caught a hold of God's divine provisions and how he blesses his people for those of us who tap into his flow. And it, it, it totally changed my life. Um, and so if you're listening to me this morning, you might be one of those Christians who you, you tithe because you love God and the word tells you to tithe or you give because you're a giver and you, you don't mind giving, but you have not yet caught a hold of God's divine provision uh, in your life. I'm telling you that uh, if you would document 
your seesawing and, and document when God speaks to your heart and then watch God do what he says he's going to do, it'll change your life. Because once you get a hold of the revelation that we serve a God that will bless us by his hand and not necessarily by our jobs or by our businesses, although he will, but he uses divine means to bless us. Once you get that understanding, once you get a hold of that concept and that becomes real to you, it, will ch it changes your life. It totally changes your life. And so I I've been walking with the Lord a long time. And it doesn't, it doesn't really matter now what people say about uh, tithing. It doesn't really bother me what people say about sowing seed, whether or not it works. or It's just man or, you know, it, it's, there's nothing to that. That doesn't really bother me anymore. It, just like it doesn't bother me about people who say they don't believe in, in Jesus, that Jesus was just a good prophet. He wasn't the son of God. That, you know, I, I have a revelation that Jesus is the son of the living God. I have a revelation that my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I have a revelation that I am saved, blood-bought, born again, fire baptized. That, nothing's, nothing people can say is going to change that. They can burn all the Bibles. They can teach all whatever they want to teach. That's not going to change. That has been uh, 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 impressed in my spirit that I am a child of the Most High God. And just like I know I am saved and on my way to heaven, I know just like I know I'm saved, that I know that God provides for me and my family by divine provision, and nothing can change that. Why? Because I have tried uh, the biblical economic concept. I have seen the hand of God, and it doesn't matter now. It just does not matter now. And this month, I'm trying to get as many people as I can to get a hold of the fact that the God that you and I serve is our provider. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is a provider who will provide supernaturally for your needs if you can catch a hold of the revelation that that is part of who he is. He, he is a blesser. He is a provider. He is, he is the father. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is uh, the one who provides for us. And if you can get a hold of that from your spirit and not from your intellect, it will totally change your life. This morning, I'm going to start with Haggai chapter uh, one. Here we have a story about the children of Israel where they have been released from captivity. They have been in captivity for uh, over 16, 20 years in Babylon. God has released them. And uh, now uh, God is hoping that they come back to Israel to rebuild the temple. But time has passed on, at least 16, 20 years has passed since they have been released from captivity and they have not rebuilt the temple of God. When they came back, they start rebuilding their own homes. They start rebuilding their businesses, but they did not attempt to rebuild the temple. And so now God is is, is dealing with them because now God is saying, you know, I, I, I'm upset with you because I release you from captivity and decades have gone by and you still have not attempted to rebuild, to rebuild my house, to rebuild my temple. So we pick up in Haggai chapter 1, verse 5. Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but have harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build a house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expect it much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you bought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with his own house. God told the children of Israel, he said, now listen, you don't care about me. You only care about you. And so because you don't care about me, he says, listen, uh, I blew away what you care about so you can understand and know how I feel when you ignore what I care about. Watch what he says in verse 10. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth 
its crop. He says in verse 10, he says, because of your action, he says, listen, I shut up heaven. He says, what was supposed to be a blessing coming your way, God said, I stopped it. I stopped the blessings coming your way. I shut up heaven. Why? Because you don't care anything about me. And because you don't care anything about me, God says, you know what? I'm going to blow away what you care about so you can understand how I feel when you ignore what I care about. He says, I stopped the blessings. He says, when you ignore me, I'm going to ignore you. In other words, he's saying, in essence, Israel, you turned your back on me. And because you turned your back on me, he said, I'm going to turn my back on you. You didn't take care of my house. I'm not going to take care of your house. I gave you ample time to change your ways, to change your mind, to turn towards working on my temple. You've been back 16, 20 years, and you have not attempted to do anything in reference to my temple, in reference to what's on my heart. He says, okay, I shut up heaven. I stopped the blessings. The blessings that were supposed to be coming your way, God said, I stopped them. Watch what he says in verse 11. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains and on the grain, the new wine, the oil, and whatever the ground produces on man and cattle and on the labor of your hands. He says in verse 10, he says, I shut the heavens. I shut up heaven. He said, I did this because you really didn't care about what was on my heart. You really didn't care about my temple. He was only concerned about your house, about your business, about what concerns you. He said, so because you didn't care about me, I'm not going to worry myself about what you care about. I stopped the blessings. Now, here it is. You and I can only be blessed by divine permission. Let me say it again. You and I can only be blessed by divine permission. Now, I'm not talking about a paycheck from your, from your job. I mean, I'm not talking about going to work in 40, 50, 60 hours a week and, you know, getting a few dollars from, from your job. I'm not talking about, you know, you busting your tail uh, 24 hours a day trying to uh, work a business and it barely stays afloat. I mean, it, it meets, um, you know, pays a few bills. I, I, I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about divine provision where you and I tap into the heart of God through obedience of blessing what concerns him and then the seeing God has opened up streams of income that this flood into your life. In order for you and I to operate on that level of provision, we had to be blessed by divine permission. And so God told the children of Israel, he says, listen, you've been back from captivity. You haven't concerned yourself about rebuilding my temple. You've been rebuilding your homes, rebuilding your businesses. And so because of that, I stopped the blessings from coming. I shut up heaven. He says, now, consider your ways. He says, in essence, if it's not working for you, consider your ways. Consider your ways. He says, now, don't act like I'm not giving it to you. Don't act like I'm not blessing you. He says, because I'm looking for someone to bless. But he says, if your financial situation is not working, if you're not happy with your situation, he says, consider your ways. Now watch what Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 18 says. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your forefathers as it is today. Uh, the text says we are to remember that it is God who gives us the ability, the know-how, the skill set, the favor, the opportunity to get wealth. And he says the reason he does that is for us to help him to establish his covenant. And so now, if you are a Christian who believes that your sources come from your job or your, your job is your source, should I say, then if you lose your job, you're going to freak out. If you believe that your, your, your source is your business, if your business dries up or if something happens to the business, 
then you're going to freak out. But if you have, a, have an understanding that God is your source, that everything you have comes from God and, and God is the one who sustains you and sustains your family, then when your job is lost or if the business doesn't do as well, you're not, you're not moved because you understand that God is Jehovah Jireh. He is the one that provides for you. He is the one that has given you the ability and the opportunity to get the wealth. And so if he has dried up one a brook here, I'll give you another brook to go to, to, to feed you from. Romans chapter 11, verse 36, the New Living Translation, the text says, for everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. I love this verse. It says, everything comes from him. Everything comes from God and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. What does that mean? It simply means that God owns it all. God claims sovereignty over everything. He claims sovereignty over me, over you, over your children, over my children, over your business, over my business, over your finances, over my finances, over your spouse, over my spouse. Whatever you and I have, God says it all exists for me and for my glory. And so once you get a hold of the revelation that God is sovereign over everything, everything belongs to him. He is the one that blesses us. He is the one that provides for us. It changes now your f operation or your flow in terms of your finances. It changes how you see things when it comes to your money. It changes how you handle your money. It changes how you uh, 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 buy things. It changes how you uh, 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 sow seed. It changes everything. Once the concept of God is my provider, once that is established in your spirit, in your knower, it changes how you operate when it comes to your money. Now, in Luke chapter 12, beginning with verse 15, there's a story here about a gentleman who is rich, has lots of money, and he takes his goods, he stores up his goods, and when he realizes that he doesn't have enough room for all that he has, the text says he tears down the barns that he has and he builds, builds bigger barns to put his stuff in it. And then the Lord comes and says, this night, your soul is going to be required of you. Now, who is all this stuff going to go to? So watch what the text says in Luke chapter 12, beginning with verse 15, the NIV translation. Then said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Jesus says in this verse, he says, watch out, be on guard, watch out for greed. Now, when Jesus tells us to watch out, to be on guard and to watch out for greed, what Jesus is talking about is for us to be mindful of generosity. He says, guard your heart, watch out for the greed that will try to come into your life, into your heart. And so when he tells us to do that, what he's really dealing with is generosity and the spirit of generosity. One of the things that is good to ask yourself as a believer is, it's good to ask yourself, am I a generous person? And there's a lot of saints that God has blessed uh, God has been good to and God has provided for but they're stingy there's nothing like a stingy saint um, because their, 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 their concept of, of money is still tied to the world and to the world system their concept of finances is still tied to I work and because I worked I got a paycheck or I did a business and because I did a business, I got blessed. Well, that may very well be true, but they missed the bigger picture. And that is if God was to withhold the resources, you wouldn't get blessed. And so they, they missed the bigger picture that 
in spite of you working, in spite of your business, God is still working behind the scenes to bless you in spite of yourself. And so they missed this whole concept of generosity. And so it's important to ask yourself, am I a generous person? The Bible says in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, it is more blessed to give than to receive. The Bible says it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, let me give you some understanding of that scripture. What that scripture really is saying is that it's better to be in a position where you can bless somebody than to have to be in a position where someone has to bless you for you to get by. Now, I've been in both places. I've been in a place where uh, I, I needed someone to bless me. I can remember in undergraduate school, uh, I, I had nothing. I mean, I was, I was walking around with cardboard in my shoes because I didn't have any money to buy uh, any shoes. In fact, uh, I was down in the projects, a true story, down in the projects, and I paid $5, I think maybe $10, for some shoes, some tennis shoes that had spikes on them uh, from this uh, uh, young man who was just selling them on the street. I had $10 in my pocket. I pulled out my money. I gave it to him. I tried on the shoes. They fit. I literally took the shoes off my feet. They were red suede Nikes with the little Nike thing on them. I took them off my feet. I threw them in the dumpster in front of the liquor store and put those shoes, took them out of the box and put those shoes on my feet. True story. Because I had walked out of my shoes and that's all I had. I had cardboard in those shoes and I needed somebody to bless me uh, with anything I could get. And this gentleman comes selling shoes. They probably were hot. I don't know. I, I didn't ask any questions. I, you know, what, my question was, what size are they? And so when I took them out, tried them on, they fit. Hey, I take your $10. I took the shoes off my feet, threw them in the trash, put those on, and kept walking. And, you know, my friends made fun of me because they're like, you know, why are you walking around there with those golf shoes on? You know, they had little spikes on them. I, hey, I had some new shoes. My feet was not rubbing up against the concrete because I had new souls. Amen. So my point is, I have been in a position where I needed to be blessed. And I've been in a position where I could bless somebody. And I'm telling you, being in a position where you can bless somebody is more uh, enjoyable than it is being in a position where you need somebody to bless you. That's what the scripture says. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Now, When it comes to generosity, I just want to hit on this for a moment about generosity and being generous, being a generous person, being a, a, a Christian who is generous with the blessings that God has uh, blessed you with, being able to share with others the goodness of what God has blessed your life with. Uh, there are a couple of things I just want to, a couple of key things I want to say about generosity. Because sometimes you know, we hold on to so, so tightly to what's in our hands. See, if you hold on to what's in your hands, yeah, nothing's coming out of your hand, but then God can't get nothing into your hand, neither because your hand is shut. And so at some point, you've got to grow in your relationship with Christ where you understand, I, I need to be a, a generous person because the God that we serve, he's a generous God. Two key things about generosity. The first thing about generosity is this, contrary to what people think or believe, generosity increases your money. Let me say that again. Being generous causes your money to increase. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 25, a generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. This verse says that a generous person will prosper. That's a true statement because the text says that what you may happen for others, God will make happen for you. That goes back to the teaching that we had last Sunday about sowing and reaping. And it's a, it's a, it's a principle. And God says what you may happen for others, he'll make happen for you. And so when you are a generous person, you prosper. You prosper when you are generous. You, you prosper when you bless people. And when you start blessing people, people start blessing you. And so when you are a generous person, your money multiplies, it increases. And then the second point about generosity is this, and that is generosity provides a protection from God. When you're generous, 
when you operate in the spirit of generosity, it provides a protection from God. Psalms 112 verses 5 through verse 6. I'm reading out of the Living Bible translation. Verse 5 says, and all goes well for the generous man who conducts his business fairly. Verse 6 says, such a man would not be overthrown by evil circumstances. God's constant care of him will make a deep impression on all who sees it. That's a powerful uh, few verses there because it says here, it says, all will go well for the man who's generous, who conducts his business fairly. It's nothing worse than trying to do business with someone who lacks integrity. It's nothing worse than trying to do business with someone who's always trying to get over. It's nothing worse than trying to do business with somebody who's always trying to get a, a price cheaper than what the market says. You know, I don't mind getting a, a, um, a good price, but at some point you say, you know what, I just need to pay the fair market value. You know, you're not trying to get over anybody. You're not trying to beat anybody. You just want a fair price. But you got some people, man, who just, you know, they always just want to beat someone down and get the better hand on somebody, always looking for a deal. At some point, you got to come to that place where you're saying, you know what, I'm not really looking for the deal. I'm just looking for what's fair. And the text says that a man who's generous conducts his business fairly. What does that mean? It means he's not trying to get over anybody. He's not trying to take advantage of anybody. He just, he just simply wants a fair, reasonable price. In verse 6 says, a man would not, this such a man would not be overthrown by evil circumstances. In other words, evil circumstances would not be able to get an upper hand in your business or be able to take advantage of you because you conduct your affairs in an honest and in a way of integrity. And he says, this man will make a deep impression on everyone who sees him. This type of man or woman who conducts themselves in a way that's generous, people will look at their lives and say, you know what, that, I like them. I like how they handle business. They will see and be impressed by your generosity, by your fairness, and how you conduct yourselves. Now, he says in verse 16, he says, the ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. Now, when it comes to divine provision, there are several ways that God will provide uh, for your needs. So there's several ways that God will provide uh, for you. And I've seen God provide for me in all three ways. And it is amazing how you can look at the hand of God and see him moving supernaturally in your situation once you get a hold of this concept and you start understanding uh, divine provision. I've seen God provide for me in all three ways. But there's, there's several ways that God uh, provides for you when it comes to divine provision. Uh, one of the ways is that God will provide by the hand of man. Let me say that again. God will provide by the hand of man. He will use man to bless you. He'll use man to provide uh, resources for you. Uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 38, Jesus is talking. You know this scripture. This is one of the scriptures I use when it comes to offering time and it comes to us honoring God with our resources. But Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, he says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you Again, Jesus says that we, when we give, it should be given unto us. But he says it's going to be given back to us in good measure, pressed down, shaken together. He says, shall men give into your bosom. God will provide for your needs through the hand of another man or woman. God will touch the heart of a person, of an individual who have what you need. Sometimes it's money. Sometimes it's favor. Sometimes it's a connection. Sometimes it's, it's something tangible that you need. But I have seen God provide for me through the hands of men and for women. Building this church, I've seen God touch the hand of men. 
uh, uh, building my, my first home, I, I saw God touch the hand of men. I can give you countless times that I can go back to and trace back to where God had literally touched the heart of a man or of a woman and they provided the resources or they opened the door for me or they connected me with someone who needed what I needed or who had what I needed, should I say. God will do that for you. God will provide for you through the hands of men. And then the second way that God provides for us is God will provide for you by his hand. God will supernaturally say, okay, I'm not going to use man on this one. This one I'm going to do myself. Philippians chapter 4 verse 19, the text says, but my God should supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. God says that he will provide for our need. Watch this now, according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. David says this over in Psalms 37, verse 25, the NIV translation. David says, I was young and now I'm old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. David said, I was a young man, now I'm old. And he said, I have never seen a child of God forsaken by God, nor have I seen their seed, their children begging bread. What was David saying? David was saying that God takes care of his children. God takes care of us. And so God, not only will he provide for us through the hands of men, he will provide for us through his own hand. He said he will supply our need. Now, it's important for us to really understand what our needs are versus what our wants are. I, I, I did a teaching on this a while back. I just want to touch on this. I'm not, this is not my, my subject matter, but it's important to just hit on this. Uh, sometimes we get confused as to our needs and as to our wants. The text says, but God should supply all your needs or your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And so what is a need? Well, a need is food, is clothing, is a roof over your head. And, it's, it's, and in this day and age, it's, it's transportation. The text says, God should supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And so we have to understand what our needs are. And then you have to understand what your wants are. A want are choices of quality of need. That's all, I, that's all a want is or wants are. They are choices of quality of need. In other words, I have a need of shelter. And so I have a one bedroom house. That's a need. I have a roof over my head. That's a need. I have a, a one bedroom house or a, 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 a two bedroom house. I have a, a roof over my head. That's a need. A want is, okay, I don't want a two-bedroom house or a one-bedroom house or apartment. I want a 5,000-square-foot house or home. So now I have moved from a need to a want, okay? Because I want 5,000 square feet, but I don't need 5,000 square feet. All I need is a roof over my head, okay? The text of God shall supply your need. So God will see to it that you have a roof over your head. But sometimes we move from need to once we get them confused. And so the problem that we have as Christians is we take our money and we spend our money on what we want. And then we spend all of our time on our needs, begging God to meet our need. Let me say that again. We take all our money and we spend our money on our wants. And then we spend all of our time on our knees praying, asking God to meet our needs. And we have it turned around when we should be using the money on our needs and believing God for our wants. But we switch it. This is why a lot of Christians get in trouble financially because they take their resources that God has supplied them with to meet their needs. And they take the resources and they go after their wants. And when they go after their wants, they mess up their needs. Now. The third way that God provides for us, he provides for us by the hand of a man or woman, by man. 
He provides for us by his own hand. And then God will provide for us by our enemy. I've seen God bless me through people who just did not like me. I've seen people literally give me a promotion who would look me in the face and this rather just call me a nasty name. But God made them bless me. <laughs> he made them give me a promotion. I've seen God create a whole uh, division, a whole, a whole unit, and I sat around for months waiting for everybody to be hired. Why? Because God will provide by the hand of your enemy. In 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 2 through verse 4, this is about the prophet Elijah. Verse 2 says, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Corinth that is before Jordan. Verse 4, And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded ravens to feed thee there. Now, here's a situation with the prophet Elijah. He prophesies a drought. The drought comes. And so now God tells him to leave the brook that he's at and go to another brook. And he obeys God. And God says he has commanded the ravens to feed him at this new location that he's sending him to. Now, you've got to understand that ravens are unclean birds. They're unclean birds and all they eat is roadkill. All they eat is this dead carcasses on, on the ground. They don't care about anybody else. They don't care about other birds. All they care about is themselves and they just go at the roadkill. But God says, I'm gonna use this unclean bird, this, 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 this bird that cares nothing about no one else but itself and I'm gonna use that bird to feed you. That is an indication or a, a, a similitude, if you will, of God saying that I'm going to use what you least expect to feed you and to provide for you. I'm going to use what you would least expect in your logic to be the answer to your provision and bless you. God would take your enemy and make him your footstool. God would take those who would mistreat you, those who will run you down with their tongue, those who will discredit you and try to sabotage you in the, in the back, in the corner, in the booth, in the dark. God said, I would take those same folks who try to mess over you and I'll make them bless you. I'll make them uh, be, a, uh, be a blessing to you. I'll use them to channel resources into your hands. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7, NIV translation, the text says, when a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies live at peace with him. See, when you and I live righteous before God, when we live upright before God, when God can look at our heart and see the integrity of our heart, the text says that when we live a way that's pleasing to God, it says it will make even our enemies be at peace with us. It'll make them be at peace with us. You ever had someone who just didn't like you? You don't know why they didn't like you. Uh, you never did anything to them. All you know is that you know in your spirit, this person really doesn't care for me. But they're at peace with you. They don't like you, but they don't bother you. God is saying, that's the way it is. For those of us who a place to him. He'll make our enemies be at peace with us. So God will bless us by the hands of our enemies. Now, watch what the text says in verse 17. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. Now, this, 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 this rich man is thinking to himself, he's reasoning with himself, and he's asking himself, now, what, what should I do? Because I have so much stuff that I don't have enough room. And so what am I going to do with all this stuff that I have? Now, third point I want to make about divine provision, and that is when it comes to divine provision, it's so important for us to understand why God blesses us. See, I, I know why God has blessed me. I am fully aware why God has been so generous towards me and why he has blessed me. I understand that God wants to use me as a, a, a instrument to funnel things through. Um, 
I remember when we first started the ministry, uh, we had Thompson and Thompson's properties. My wife and I, we were in real estate. We had investment properties and we would buy properties. We would flip them and we was, man, we was making thousands of dollars. We was making money, just buying properties, flipping them and, and selling them. Uh, we, if we didn't want to flip them, we put tenants in them and, 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 and we would rent them out for a while and then we'd come back and sell them or we'd pull money out of them and, and go get other real estate. We, we had a real estate um, business going. I worked for the government, she worked for Delta, and we had our Thompson Thompson's properties on the side. And so we was doing real estate. And lo and behold, uh, I was thinking all that money was for us. But little did I know that when God called me into the ministry, he was going to inquire of that money. And so when God called me into the ministry full time, he said, now what I want you to do is take all that money that I allowed you to get your hands on. He says, I want you to take those thousands of thousands of dollars and I want you to buy me a strip mall. And I want you to buy that strip mall and I want you to now start me a church. And so when we started church, we had no members. We didn't steal anybody's members. We didn't do a uh, church on a different night. So, you know, or do Bible study on a different night. Then somebody else or other folks, members can come to us. No, we had no members. And we did Bible study on Wednesday nights like everybody else. We did Sunday services on Sunday morning like everybody else. And we just believed God. And I preached the chairs, just preached the chairs. But God said, I want you to take that money that I blessed you with. And I want you to take those thousands of dollars and I want you to buy that strip mall. So I, I had to take all that money that I thought was mine and take that money and buy that strip mall. Now, I had no problems with that because I realized then that the money that God had blessed me with was not for me, but it was for his work and for his kingdom. And I'd never had a problem with it. That's why God has no problem with blessing me because he understands that Doug understands why I bless him. Now, it's like the water with wet getting wet with water. You can't handle a cup of water or a glass of water and not get wet. If you handle water, you're gonna get wet. And so if you handle God's resources, God's gonna allow a little bit to flow over on you. So I'm not complaining. I'm just simply trying to say that when it comes to divine provision, you and I have to understand why it is that God allows us to be blessed. Why, the, why it is that he allows resources to come into our hands. This guy here in the text he has all the resources here and he's talking to himself and saying man i got so much stuff well i don't have enough room for all this stuff i need to build bigger barns and so he starts talking to himself now when god starts blessing you you're going to see abundance let me say that again when god starts blessing you from the concept of provisional blessing, you're going to see abundance. I mean, because God don't, he doesn't, do, he doesn't do little stuff. He's a big God. And so his concept, our concept of big is not God's concept of big. He's, he's, a, he's a big God. And so when God starts blessing you in terms of divine provision, it's important for you to understand that why God is blessing you. And you have to know that he's not blessing you just for you. Now, he don't mind that you uh, get a little bit of it, but he doesn't want you being confused of the fact that this is all for me. No, that's not why he's blessing you. God's blessing you because he wants to use you as an instrument where he can channel money through to get his work done. There are some people in the body of Christ that all they do is make money. And their ministry is giving. I remember years ago, we met a Caucasian lady from Florida and uh, we was with a bishop friend of ours and their whole mindset, their whole concept was making money and trying to figure out who they're supposed to get the money to. That's all they did. God blessed them in such a way, in such a degree that all they did was make money and all they did was trying to pray, okay, God, who do we give this money to? Who's supposed to get this check? And that's all they, that, that, that was their ministry. And giving is a gift. If you look in the scriptures, you'll see that giving is part of, of, of a ministry gift. It's like the gifts of helps, the gift of prophecy. Giving is a gift that God places on his people. And so, and he has to do that because, you know, you can't build 
big buildings and, and, and go around the world and tithes and offerings because you don't have it, you know, 20% of the people um, providing, you know, 80% of the resources, no matter how much you teach or no matter what you say. It's only 20%, it's just a given rule, the 80-20 rule that you get 20% doing 80% of the, of the work or, and of the giving. It's just a, a fact. It's just a fact. Some of you right now listening to me, don't get mad at me, but some of you right now have not tied in years or never. Some of you right now, listen to me, don't give. Or you might give a few dollars because you have not yet caught on to the revelation of divine provision. It's okay. I, I'm, not, I'm not picking on you or beating up on you. I'm just trying to teach you right now. This is a teaching moment. I'm just trying to help you. I'm just trying to help you. But this, this guy here, he, he looks at all of his resources and he said, man, he starts talking to himself and he says, what am I going to do with all this, all this stuff that I have? I, I need, I, I, I'm out of room. I need more room. Now notice this in the text. Now once does he says, God did it. Now once does he acknowledge that God's been good to me. Now once does he ask himself, what can I do to be a blessing to God who has blessed me with these resources? Not once does he say to himself, how can I be a blessing to someone else? Never mind God, how can I be a blessing to someone else? Now, once does he say that in the text? He is so into stuff that he doesn't see God and he doesn't see anyone else. Some of us are so into stuff that we don't see God and we don't see anyone else. We're just into stuff. We are into material possessions. That's the way the world. And you're that way because your mindset or your concept of money is still attached to the world system. Now, watch what the text says, verse 18. Then he said, this is what I do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. He says, okay, I got a problem. I got all this, these resources here. He says, I'll tell you what I'm, I'm going to do. I'm going to tear down the barns that I currently have. And I'm going to build me bigger barns so I can put all my stuff in them. Now watch what the text says in verse 19. And I shall say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. He said, I, I'm going to say to myself, you know what? I got all I need. I can retire now. I'll put my feet up, get in my lazy chair, and I'm just going to eat, drink, and be merry because I, I have plenty. I'm just going to take, take my ease now. Now, I notice that the text says he starts talking to himself. This is important. He starts reasoning with himself. He starts talking to himself. He starts uh, having a conversation to himself about his money and about his stuff. Now, this is important because what this tells us in the teaching and what Jesus is trying to get across to us through this parable of this individual who has abundance and sees the need to tear down the barns that he has to build bigger barns and put more stuff in them. Never ask about what God might need. Never ask about anyone else. All he's into is stuff. This is important because what Jesus is trying to get across to you and I is the fact that his heart is connected to his money. Please don't miss that. If you don't hear anything else I say in this teaching, please, please don't miss this one simple point. And that is the reason this gentleman did not acknowledge God, did not acknowledge anyone else with all his abundance, all he saw was his stuff, was because his heart is connected to his money. Now, when you and I allow our heart to be connected to our money, we start making emotional decisions with our money. This is why a lot of saints have trouble tithing. The reason you have trouble tithing is because your heart is still connected to your money. And when your heart is still connected to your money, you, you make emotional decisions based on your money. At some point in your walk as a believer, you have to step out there and start believing God for divine provision. You have to start 
believing that God is Jehovah Jireh, that he is your provider. And when you get to that place where you understand and you have a, know, you have a, 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 a knowing in your spirit that the God in whom I serve is my provider, once you do that, that breaks that heart connection off of your money. Now your heart switches from your money to God. And when your heart switches from your money to God, you'll stop making emotional decisions about your money. You'll start realizing that your money now is nothing but a tool or an instrument to do what God instructs me to do because my heart now is connected with God. I don't have no trouble with releasing finances. Why? Because it's God's money. And now my heart's connected to God and not to money. And so when God speaks to Doug's heart, God, Doug says, okay, no problem. This is, what you, this is what you want me to do with your money? This is what we're going to do. My heart is not connected to money. My heart is connected to God. But when your heart is connected to your money, You make emotional decisions with your money. This is why a lot of saints are suffering financially right now. Because they make decisions based on their emotions when it comes to their money. You, when it comes to money, you can't make decisions with, with money based on your emotions, based on your heart. You have to use your understanding of money, your, 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 your concept, your mind when it comes to money, your, your intellect when it comes to money. I understand that money is a tool. You have to keep money in its place. A lot of us, we elevate money above God. This is the number one, money is the number one competitor to God. This is why God says you cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve God and money. Why? Because money is the number one competitor to God. And God would test you with money. And some of us, we have failed over and over again when it comes to the area of money because we've been tested by God and we don't pass the test. And now we wonder why God, how come you won't do this for me? And God is saying, because if I do that for you, if I release that into your hands, that money will destroy you. Money has a spirit attached to it. And so if, if you don't know how to handle money, then that spirit that is attached to that money would destroy your life. This is why you can have people who can come into millions of dollars through the lottery. All these basketball players who run into millions of dollars, all these sports players who get millions of dollars come into their hands. And in a few years, they're broke. They're literally broke. You ask yourself, how in God's green earth can someone win the lottery for $10 million? Or how can you play sports and have a $50 million contract? You're 38 now, you're you working at Wendy's. How, how could that happen? You tell yourself, that never happened to me. Well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it is happening to you on a, on a smaller scale. Because maybe only you're making, maybe you're only making $1,000 a week, but you want to give God a hundred dollars of the thousand. But see, you don't see that as the same dilemma as the ball player who makes 50 million. Because 50 million is a lot of money, a thousand dollars is not that much money. It, no, it's not the money, it's the concept. It's the principle. So if you don't know how to handle little, you won't handle much. Because that's the principle. principle. Who much is given, much is required. Now, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, New Living Translation, the text says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. This is why you have to protect your heart. You have to protect your heart because whatever you allow into your heart, you'll start making heart decisions. And so if you allow money to get into your heart and be connected to your, to your heart, you'll start making decisions with your money based on your heart. First Timothy chapter six, verse 10, the text says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Now notice, it's not money that is the root of all evil. It is the love of money that is the root of all evil. It is when your heart is connected to your money 
and you make emotional decisions with your money, that's when evil comes in. When you find somebody who's willing to take somebody's life, you know, give me, give me $5,000 and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll knock them off. Well, that's money connected to evil. And that money's connected to evil because that, there's a love for the money. This is why bad people can do bad things because their heart is connected to that money. The love of money is the root of all evil, not money. Money is just a, it's, 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 it's just a tangible uh, thing. It's just, it's just paper. It's not money. It's the love of money. It's people's heart connected to it. Now, Malachi chapter 3, verse 8, the text says, will a man rob God? We know that verse. I mean, if you've been in church a week in your life, you heard that verse. Everybody, every preacher is telling, telling you that verse right there. Every preacher wants you to know that verse right there. You, you don't even have to be saved to know that verse right there. Everybody, everybody has heard that verse right there. And what is this saying? It's saying that when your money is connected, uh, when your heart, should I say, is connected to your money, that heart decision is going to cause you to rob God. Why? Because of love. In, in the New Testament, under the New Testament, tithing is not law now, it's love. I don't tithe because uh, uh, I have to. I tithe because I want to, because of the love I have for God. And because my love for God is stronger than my money, then it's okay for me to bless God with my money because I love God more than I love money. But when there's a struggle in my heart between my money and God, then whoever has the stronger part of my heart is gonna win out in the struggle. Now I know that's hard to swallow, I know that's a little confrontational. I know some of you might say, now, oh, Pastor Doug, that's, that's just taking it a little bit too far. I love, I love me some Jesus. I, I get it. I know, I, know you love, I, I know you love you some Jesus. But the, the question is, I'm not saying you don't love Jesus. My question is, do you love Jesus more than you love your money? That's what I'm asking. That's, that's the challenge right there. And that's not something that you have to respond to me about. It's not really any, any of my business because what you give and how you conduct yourself is between you and God. But it is my responsibility as, as a teacher to teach the gospel and teach the truth. That's, that's, that's all I'm trying to do here. Teach the truth. Okay? And so you have to ask yourself, is my love for God greater than the love that I have for my finances? And then the last thing, watch what the text says as we get ready to wrap this up. In Luke chapter 12, verse 20, he says, But God said to him, You fool. Now God calls him a fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Verse 21, This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. Man, this is like, Hit, hit you in the face. This is like one of those pow in the face type uh, scriptures. It says God says you fool. God calls him a fool. This is Jesus telling the parable. I, I'm just reading the scripture here. God calls him a fool. He says you fool. He says this very night your life will be demanded of you or from you. Then who's going to get what you prepared for yourself? You have stored up all this stuff. You don't build, build bigger barns for yourself. You told yourself, I'm just gonna lay back now, retire, kick my feet up, eat, drink, and be merry. And the Lord says, uh, you, you, you're due in front of the judge, judge, judge Jesus in two hours. You, you, you do in two hours to give an account of yourself. Uh, you've got to show up before the righteous judge in a few hours. He says, you fool. You don't spend all your life trying to get all this stuff, storing it up. And in your mind, you thought that you had time to enjoy it. He said, oh, no, 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 no. Time's up. You're doing court in, in, in two hours. 
every man and woman and child will give an account to how they conduct themselves in this earth. Every one of us will give an account of our conduct to the Lord. The Bible says it's appointed on man once to die and then the judgment. The problem with that statement or that verse is that we don't know when that time is. We don't know when our appointment date is before the great righteous judge. And so why are we sitting here thinking that we have all this time and we're going to prepare all this stuff and we're going to do all this for us. You don't know when your number's going to be called. It's almost like sitting in a big auditorium and you take a number. I don't know, you have you gone into a place and they give you a number and they say, when we, you know, just sit there until we call your number. And you're sitting there waiting for your number to be called and you know, you just lose track and you don't know when your number's going to be called. But you know your number's going to be called. That's what he says. Here's my last point as I close out. When it comes to divine provision, it's very important that you accept the fact that none of what you have is yours. If you can get over ownership of your weekly paycheck, your bi-weekly paycheck, your 401k, your investment uh, portfolio, your real estate, your children, your spouse, if you, your car, your home, if you can get over the ownership of all this stuff and people, if you can just come to the realization that everything I have belongs to God. If you can detach your, your own, detach yourself from ownership of stuff, then it's easy for you then to just kind of release stuff because you recognize it's not yours anyway. We have to come to that place as believers that, hey, you know what? God's been good to me. God's blessed me. And some of us really have to acknowledge that God's been good to us. I know you're sitting there listening to me. I know you have some challenges in your finances. I know you may have some health issues. But in spite of all that, you've got to acknowledge God's been good. You know he's been good. He's been a good God. And so you've got to recognize because he's been good, you know, I, I have a responsibility to respond to him when he instructs me to do certain things or to speak to certain people when he tells me to speak. Now, here we go. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 12, as we get ready to close this thing out. The text says, for wisdom is a defense and money is a defense. Wisdom is a defense and money is a defense. Money is nothing but a defense against unforeseen attacks. That's all money is. That's all money is. It's a defense. Wisdom is a defense. If you have wisdom, you can, you can figure out how to get out of certain situations and circumstances. If you have money, you can buy your way out of certain situations or circumstances or you can fix certain things because you have money. Why? Because money is just a defense. It's not a god. It's not something you worship. It's not something you attach your heart to. Money is just a defense. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 19, and I'm gonna close. The text says, a feast is made for laughter and wine make it merry, but money answereth all things. Money answereth all things. All things. Now, money cannot answer uh, the question of love, it can't buy you love. Money can't buy you uh, integrity. Money can't buy you respect. But those are not things. Those are, those are character traits. But money can answer, money answer all things. Money can, if you've got a thing, you can buy a car, it can fix a car, it can fix a broken down washing machine, it can buy a plane ticket, it can buy a meal, it, it answers all things. And I dare say a lot of stuff that a lot of us are praying for this morning, you know, if you just had a little bit of money, you know, it probably cut your prayer list probably 80%, 90%. Because a lot of us this morning were praying for things. Money answers all things. And the reality is that God will provide for us in a supernatural way 
through divine provision if you and I cooperate with him according to his word and trust him with our finances in that area. That's why I say we're blessed by divine permission. You have to have divine permission to be blessed. God has to stamp, yes, bless them. Bless that one. Not that one. Bless that one. You have to have a divine stamp over your head. But heaven recognizes that one has been stamped blessed. Bless that one. Why? Because that one operates according to the heart of God when it comes to, to finances. That one understands how to put God and mammon in the right perspective. And that's all we're talking about this morning putting God in his proper place and putting money in its proper place in your life as a Christian. Once you do that, you will have no trouble with seeing divine provisions from heaven. So my prayer this morning as I close this thing out is that that you go before God and you ask God, Lord, if there's anything that's hindering me from flowing in your divine provision if it's any area of my life God that is unpleasing to you anything I need to do any adjustments I need to make anything God I need to do to make this thing where my finances are pleasing to you where you can flee, uh, uh, flow freely in my finances Lord please reveal it to me because I'm telling you you know you, you know you come you move from different levels in your walk with God as you're supposed to the Bible talks about going from glory to glory to glory we're supposed to grow in our understanding and in our operation uh, in terms of our conduct when it comes to the Word of God. You know, where you were last year, you shouldn't be this year. And where you are this year, you shouldn't be next year. Why? We're supposed to grow in our understanding and we're supposed to grow in our faith in God and grow in our grace in God. It's the same thing in the natural. If you have a child that's three, next year you expect them to be a little bit taller, a little bit heavier, a little bit more wiser, a little bit more responsible. You expect them to grow from one level to the next into adulthood. That's a natural progression of things. That's what you expect. The same thing spiritually. We're supposed to go from glory to glory to glory. Some of us come into the body of Christ with this one mindset of, of, of our concept about finances and we never grow. And because we never grow, we are hindered in the areas of our blessings and what God can do because we have not allowed ourselves to step out on faith, trust God, and allow God to take us from one never to the next level. And I'm telling you, God wants to do it. He wants to bless you. He will bless you. He is a blesser. He is in the blessing business. And I'm telling you, it's nothing for God to be able to bless you uh, with uh, supernatural provisions. He's a good God. He loves blessing his children. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just bless you and we honor you this morning. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity to share in the word of the Lord. And Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for the integrity of scripture. And Father, we thank you for the people of God. Father, we thank you for their desire for, for truth and their hunger for righteousness. I pray, God, that you will continue to bless your people as they cry out for the understanding and for the revelation of, of, of your truth in the area of giving. I thank you for this, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning... If you've been listening to me about God's provision, um, one of the best blessings that God has bestowed upon us as his people and, 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 and to humanity is the gift of salvation. The gift of salvation. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should call upon him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so this morning, if you're listening to me, but you have not made a decision as of yet to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I want to encourage you this morning to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. I want to encourage you this morning to accept the gift of salvation. There's no greater blessing that God has bestowed upon us than the blessing of salvation. 
And I'm telling you here this morning that when it comes to money, money's good, having divine provision is it's nice, but it cannot compare to having eternal life. This is why Jesus told this rich man in this text that you're a fool for you to go after money and stuff and not pursue eternal life over that stuff. He says you're a fool because now you're at this time your life is going to be required of you and all that stuff that you have gained in the natural is going to go to somebody else. So this morning I want you to really pray about your relationship with Christ and you know pursue your relationship with Christ. Pursue eternal life over money, over stuff. Here's what I know. The Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. When you and I, when we put God first, when we seek a relationship with him first, then all that other stuff that we concern ourselves with, that's, that stuff's going to come. But what's really important right now is your soul, is your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if you're listening to me this morning and if you accept the fact that Jesus died for your sins, he died for your sins, he paid the price through the blood, or through his blood on Calvary. And now he's seated at the right hand of the Father, praying for you for the abundant life. If you accept the fact that Jesus died for your sins and died for the sins of all humanity, you say, Pastor, I, I want to be saved. I want to give my life to Christ. I want the Lord Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. If that's you this morning, I, I want to lead you into uh, the sinner's prayer. And I'm going to ask you, if you would please, just bow your head after me and repeat after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I ask that you forgive me of all of my sins. I truly believe that Jesus Christ is your son who suffered on the cross and died, went to hell, and on the third day was raised from the dead. And he's now seated at your right hand, praying for me that I might have life and have it more abundantly. Father, I'm asking for Jesus Christ to come into my heart, to come into my life, and to be my personal Lord and Savior. Father, by faith, I believe that I'm saved, that I'm born again, that my name is now written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Well, God bless you. Listen, if you prayed that prayer with me this morning, please contact us. The information is on the screen. We really want to know that you gave your life to Christ. We want to celebrate with you. So take a few moments, if you would, please, and contact us. Let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Amen. Well, are you ready to worship the Lord in your giving? The Bible says over Luke chapter 6, 38, you know what it says. We have already read that verse to you today. Jesus says, give, and it should be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Shall man give into your bosom. But with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Very simply put, Jesus is saying, listen, you can't not outgive God. And so, if you have a need of, of a harvest, you get to determine the size of the harvest based on the seed that you sow. This morning, as you get ready to worship the Lord in your giving, as you get ready to prepare your tithes and your offerings, you know what you have need of. You know what um, uh, is before you in terms of your financial situation. No one knows better than you. You know exactly what you need. You know exactly what you believe in God for. I'm just simply saying, just make sure that uh, what you believe in God for, that your seed is proportionate to what you believe in your harvest to be. Amen. And so whatever you decide to do, whatever the Lord speaks to your heart, just trust him, obey him. Once you get your, your seed and your ties prepared, if you would please, just simply stretch them towards heaven as a sign of contact and I want to pray of them. Amen. Father, we just thank you for these ties and offerings. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the people of God. We thank you, Father God, for their generous spirits. Now, Father, as a corporate body, Lord, we pray as one man over these ties and offerings. And Father, we declare and decree every need met in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Father, we thank you that every financial need, every personal need, every spiritual need, every emotional need is met in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that there's no lack in the household of the saints. Lord, we call in uh, promotions. We call in contracts. Father, we call in bonuses. Lord, we call in abundance in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for showing yourself strong on their behalf. Meet them at their faith, Father, in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we thank you that the needs of your house are met. We thank you that there's no lack in your house, God, that every need is met. And we thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can you or someone you know benefit from additional food items? Come visit us Saturday at the Bountiful Harvest Food Pantry from 1 to 3 p.m. We are also seeking additional volunteers to assist with setup and food distribution. Please give us a call or text us at 678-468-0868 for more information. Again, that number is 678-468-0868. Spread the good news. We look forward to seeing you there. Do you or someone you know need prayer? We at Harvest Rain Church International invite you to connect with us for a social distancing drive through prayer experience at the Academy at Harvest Rain, located at 51 Sonoy Road in Fairburn, on Saturday, August 22nd, from 1 to 3 o'clock p.m. For more information, you can contact us at 770-969-2040. That's 770-969-2040. We look forward to seeing you and praying for you at our drive through Prayer on the Move. Daughters of the King Women's Ministry is hosting a virtual Paint and Praise event August 29th and 30th from 3 to 6 p.m. We would love for you to join us. Space is limited and on a first come, first serve basis. This is a fun, uplifting event that is ensured to inspire creativity. Create your own masterpiece while praising God and connecting with others, all from the comfort and safety of your home. Each painter will be supplied with the essentials and step-by-step -step instructions by our personal art innovator, Color Frenzy. Curbside pickup is also available. Please visit harvestrain.org for this and all upcoming events for more information. We look forward to seeing you at the virtual Paint and Praise event. Join us Sunday mornings in the parking lot of Harvest Rain Church from 8.30 to 9.30 a.m. Bring your entire family and your pets too. And let's worship together in the parking lot of Harvest Rain Church and hear praise and worship plus an inspirational message from Pastor Doug. And sometimes you got to talk to yourself and say, you know what? I don't care how you feel, we're going to rejoice in the God of our salvation. Sometimes you have to command yourself to open your mouth and bless your God. Sometimes you got to talk to yourself and speak over yourself and prophesy over yourself and say, self, I don't care how you feel, we're going to bless God. I don't care how you feel, we're going to worship God. We're going to give Him some praise. We're going to honor Him. We're going to keep our focus on Him. Do not allow any thought that is not a godly thought to resonate in your mind. See you Sunday. Well, God bless you this morning. Thank you so much for tuning in. Again, I want to invite you out to church on the lot. We had a powerful time this morning. God is so faithful. And so if you find it in your heart to, to come out, um, this, uh, please do so. Again, if you're, you're not there yet, I understand. Just know that we love you. We're praying for you. But for those of you who say, well, I might try this. Just give it a try. I think you might be pleasantly surprised by um, the presence of God and, and the joy that it, it gives your heart is to see the other saints just kind of waving and hunking at you from a distance. Amen. Well, God bless you. Look forward to ministering to you Wednesday night.